Post Warhaft. Επειδή η διάλεξη είναι στα αγγλικά και τώρα που άνοιξε και το μικρόφωνο, ε, θα συνεχίσω στα αγγλικά. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, my name is Maria Γιώργοπούλου. I'm the director of the Gennadios Library at the American School of Classical Studies. And uh, it is a great pleasure for me to, and an immense honor to welcome to the Gennadion and to the American School Uh, Gail Holst Warhaft from Ithaca, New York. Uh, and I think the Ithaca will come back to us and, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it, or she will talk about it. Uh, I recently found out uh, that uh, Gail's Greek name is uh, Electra, and uh, so I will uh, move between the two. So Electra is a poet and an academic with a PhD in comparative literature from Cornell University. Uh, but uh, she has also had many more distinctions in life and many other hats, a fact that ma makes her a fascinating personality. Uh, and uh, I hasten to say, as uh, you will know and you will notice from the title and from the talk, uh, that uh, her talk uh, is, uh, in fact, uh, has to do, of course, uh, with uh, the exhibition, uh, the Epic of Anatolia, that uh, my colleague Natalia Vogeikov uh, and uh, Natasha Lemou Lemos have uh, curated uh, here at the Macriani's wing, and I hope that you will all have the chance uh, to visit. Not tonight, uh, but starting tomorrow, the exhibition is open from Wednesdays to through Sundays. Um, Gail Holst uh, studied art history in English in her native Australia, wanting to get a cheap ride to Europe at the age of 19, when she had already finished college, apparently. She's a precocious child. She hopped on a Greek ship that transported immigrants from Greece to Australia, and a month later arrived at the port of Piraeus in 1965. She recalls, in a televised interview for Monogramma that I urge you to watch on YouTube if you have not seen it, that on her first night out in Plaka, she knew immediately that she should have been born Greek. From then on, she has lived in Greece on and off, has befriended many famous Greeks, poets like Katerina Gelaki Rourke, and musicians like Mikis Theodorakis and Marisa Koch, uh, and has learned our language. Most importantly, she identifies with Greece and Greek culture as a musician, as a journalist, as a thinker, as a teacher, as a translator, and feels alive when she's here. She's a Greek cosmopolitan, Nia Elinida Cosmopolitisa. During the Greek dictatorship of 1967 to 74, she moved back to Australia, studied harpsichord, and became a journalist while also joining forces with Australian Greeks to find the fight the Hunda. It was in Australia that she met the legendary Mikis Theodorakis when she became an impromptu interpreter during his visit. Uh, in the 70s, while researching a book on Greek music, she performed with Greece's leading composers, including Theodorakis. She played the harpsichord and performed for the piece uh, in Epidavros, and also Dionysus Solomos, Dionysus Solomos, sorry, Dionysius Savopoulos and Marisa Koch. <laughs> Uh, two books uh, on Greek music followed, Road to Rembetica, Music of a Greek Subculture, that was printed, uh, published in 1975, and there were uh, editions, uh, more editions, a Greek translation, translation in German, uh, in Turkish, and in French. And the second book, Theodorakis, Myth and Politics in Modern Greek Music, uh, which was published in 1980 and uh, was uh, updated uh, and, uh, uh, and translated into Greek uh, in 2014. Later, she began translating modern poetry and uh, Greek poetry and prose, the collected poems of Nikos Kavadias, 
uh, for which she received the translation prize from Columbia University, Achilles' fiancé, Alkizes, uh, in 1991, Mauthausen of Iacovos Campanellis in 95, The Suppliants uh, of uh, Aeschylus, Four Stories of Alexandros Papandiamandis, uh, I Had Three Lives, Selected Poems of Mikis Todorakis, and more. Uh, she's a prolific and a wonderful person, so it's very hard to do justice to her. Uh, in the meantime, she had moved to Ithaca, New York. Uh, in 1980, she married, had a family, got her PhD, uh, taught, <laughs> and did many other things. Um, and uh, in uh, the 1990s, having joined the Institute for European Studies, Gail wrote two books on laments and grief and become publi began publishing her own poetry. Uh, the Cue for Passion, Grief and Its Political Uses uh, came out in 2000, and a book that is related to Greek Mirologia, Dangerous Voices, Women Laments, and Greek Literature was published uh, in London uh, in 1992. And uh, she says characteristically about the Mirologia and about this book uh, that in the West you have to get over your pain. Here in Greece, you wear your pain, and the Mirologia are a testament to this, which I think is extremely powerful. I'm getting to the end my, of my remarks. Gail is also a very effective teacher, and I'm privileged to have met her through one of her students, George Sirimis at Yale, uh, many years ago. She's also an activist, and she doesn't stay still. Uh, she founded a Mediterranean Studies initiative, organized conferences, concerts, and talks, um, and uh, on a trip to, Greek, to Greece in 2009, she became seriously concerned about the water crisis in many parts of the country and the Mediterranean, and this has resulted uh, in a grant, uh, in a, a longer project, and in two books, uh, Losing Paradise, The Water Crisis in the Mediterranean, and Water Scarcity, Security and Democracy, a Mediterranean Mosaic. So, um, the last book uh, that, uh, the last two books that she has wrote, she has written, uh, are also about music, uh, Nisiotica, uh, a music of the Aegean Islands, a book that came out in 2020, and she hopes that it will uh, appear also in Greek, um, and a children's book on Rembetica, which uh, was published uh, this past summer, or at least this is when it, it, it came out. Uh, her own poetry, Penelope's Confession, The Fall of Athens, Lucky Country, um, and more. So an Australian woman who fell in love with Greece, studied its culture in depth, and made significant contributions. Gail Holst Warhaft writes at the beginning of one of her books, Δεν είμαι Ελληνίδα, έτσι παρατηρώ και αναλύω την ελληνική κουλτούρα σαν ένας απ' έξω. Νομίζω ότι αυτό δεν είναι αρνητικό. I'm not Greek. So I observe and analyze Greek culture as an outsider, and I think this is not bad or negative. For my generation at least, as uh, her own students, Gail feels like a mythical figure. Yet she's open, selfless, true, always young, and someone who has been involved with legendary figures larger than life. To listen to her, it's a privilege. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Maria, thank you for that lovely uh, and very flattering invitation. It makes me feel uh, very uh, privileged and also very old. <laughs> How did I fit all those things in my life? The other thing is I want to thank you for is for the invitation to speak here. Um, it sent me on a journey. Uh, every, every time I prepare something, I think, oh, I've done a lot of work on that. It won't be too difficult. But then I start doing the research, and it turns out that it's a lot of preparation and a lot of new research. And this is, um, I hope, of interest. Uh, I didn't know whether to speak in Greek or in English. Um, but I decided I'd speak in English, but I will put in some passages in both languages because when you're talking about literature, it's, I think, uh, a shame not to have the original in your ears as you listen. So the topic is nostalgia for the East, the bittersweet poetics of loss. 
And I'd like to dedicate it to the memory of Peter Mackridge, um, who was a forerunner in Greek literary studies, modern Greek literary studies at Oxford, who passed away recently. And um, I owe a lot to his um, work, as you'll see. I want to begin with a passage that's fascinated me for many years. I've quoted it elsewhere, but it's so flamboyant and so melodramatically descriptive of Greece's cultural schizophrenia that's been called dysemia and the Helenoromaic dilemma that I'm surprised it's not better known. In his journey to the Morea, or Morias, Nikos Kazantzakis writes, Stis tavernes, sta panigiria, stis skoles, amantiun ligo, i mati logiki, ke sem perento logikia, e emboraiki, ke soliades, xespun sem melancholicus, anatoliticus amaneves. Sena achti aprosdokito, xespasun mia psychi, telia diaforetiki, apotin xemethisti cathimerini psychitus. Pluto megalo, macrini nostalgia, meranchi. In the taverns, I'm translating and all the translations are mine, by the way. Um, in the taverns, at festivals, on holidays, when they've drunk a little, the small businessmen and infantry officers of the Peloponnese, so logical and selfish, break into melancholy Eastern amanevas, into a sudden longing. They reveal a spirit quite different from their sober, everyday one, a great treasure, a deep longing. In the same essay, Kazantzakis expands on the dichotomy he sees in the Greek character. Ti pire apo ton patera tu, ti apo ti mana tu, o diginis neoelinas. In exipnos, ke avathos, horis metaphysiki agonia, ke sinama, otan adhisi na tragodai, mia pikra pan cosmia, petiete apo ta anatolitika sothikatu, Spazi ti crusta ti selnikis logikis, ke ene veni apota splakna tu, olo mestirio ke skotadi i anatoli. So, what has the duly descended modern Greek taken from his father? What from his mother? He's clever and shallow, with no metaphysical anxieties. And yet, when he begins to sing, a universal bitterness leaps from his oriental bowels breaks through the crust of Greek logic, and from the depths of his being, totally mysterious and dark, the Orient emerges. For those who are unfamiliar with the sound of an amanes, and, or an amane, and for those who need to be reminded of that sound, let's listen to the, one of the great exponents of this tradition, the fabulous Smyrna refugee singer, Rita Abadzi, performing the Amanes prepi na skeftete kanis tin ora tu thanatu, o ti da bisti mavari yis ke sfini tonomatu. A man must think at the hour of his death that he'll go into the black earth and his name will be erased. Oh, 
could be accused of articulating a Greek Orientalist position where the Orient is seen as female, dark, irrational, mysterious, and yet his position is full of ambivalence. The modern Greek man comes across as inferior, as a shallow creature, until he sings an amanes. Then another side, the man's maternal inheritance, emerges. His mundane, shallow character is transformed by what? An Eastern lament, a song that reveals a spiritual depth invisible in his everyday life. We are left with a sense that this oriental lament represents a superior side of the Greek character, that his maternal inheritance, however dark and illogical, is more profound, that this longing is what transforms him into something better than he appears in his everyday life. Kazantzakis does not refer to women in his account of the modern Greek character. It is the provincial Greek petty bourgeois male that he describes in such unflattering terms. The female is the source, it seems, of what rescues the modern Greek man from shallow pragmatism. Kazantzakis was fond of dichotomies. He wrote at length and with pride about his Cretan descent and how his island represented a mixture of Eastern and Western influences poised as it was between Europe and Asia, reflecting the Apollonian and Dionysian elements inherent in Greek culture. His own life and work was full of dualities. Western educated, he was attracted to the Orient. Ascetic in many aspects of his life, he was also a sensualist. A non-believer, he never stopped seeking God. The treasure revealed to him by a singer, possibly a refugee from Asia Minor, has the bittersweet flavor of nostalgia, a longing that can never be fulfilled, but which enriches and deepens quotidian reality. In this talk, I want to link the laments for Constantinople and the Amanezas, in which Smyrna refugees express their pain for the loss of their city, to literature real, written by refugees from Asia Minor, in particular, the novelists of the so-called Generation 1930. The refugees who came to Greece before and after 1922 carried with them an incurable wound, and a yatreftipeyi, a longing for a lost homeland they expressed in music, poetry, and prose. One of the great themes of modern Greek literature is not only the pain of exile, but the idealization of a world left behind. In the writing of authors of the generation 19, so-called generation 1930s, Smyrna and Constantinople, Aivali and Vula, are bathed in the golden light of remembrance. Nostalgic, nostalgia for unrecoverable time and place is not unique. Prose and poetry written by refugees and exiles is almost by definition nostalgic. Nothing could ever compare, for example, with the perfection of Vladimir Nabokov's St. Petersburg childhood, expressed with such precision and pathos in his memoir, Speak Memory. By recalling details of a landscape, a city street, a room, a map, exiled writers create a defense against forgetting, but they are aware that there is no substitute for the loss of their homeland. By Following Leopold Bloom as he walks the streets of Dublin, James Joyce, living in Paris in self-imposed exile, recreates the urban landscape where he spent the first two decades of his life, but it has already become a mythical city. As Edward Said said, exile is the unhealable rift between a human being and a native place, between the self and its true home. Its essential sadness can never be surmounted. The remembered place to which the writer can never return, or if he could, would find utterly transformed, becomes, in the writing of some exiles, a place of extraordinary beauty and charm. In Aeolian Earth, the landscape of Kimintenia in Elias Venezis's childhood actually speaks in his memory. Trees talk, waves express emotions. The very earth is alive. Childhood, by definition, is unrecoverable, but like Nabokov's St. Petersburg, the intervening tragedies of the Russian Revolution and the catastrophe of Smyrna make the nostalgia for place and time both more bitter and sweet. 
As Peter Mackridge noted, the writers of the generation 30, 1930, who came as refugees to Greece, among them George Seferis, Ilias Venezis, Yorgos Theotokas, Cosmas Politis, all evoke a pristine world of childhood that precedes disaster. In what Mackridge calls the twofold disaster, these writers lost not only their homeland, but the precious time of childhood. Their lost homelands become timeless through their celebration in memory and art. The three novels that Mackridge discussed in his support of his argument are Theotokas's Leonis, set in Constantinople between 1914 and 1922, Venezis's Aeolian Earth, set on an isolated farm near the Kimintenia Mountains, at approximately the same time, and Cosmas Politicis at Hadzifranco, set in Smyrna between 1901 and 1902, although the time is flexible, even mythical in this novel, and there are forward flashes to the burning of the city in 1922. In his foreword to the first collection, the first edition of Aeolian Earth, Lawrence Darrell describes the setting of the book as curiously archaic, closer to Homer and Hesiod than our own noting that it begins after the expulsion from a Garden of Eden. He writes that the sense of timelessness in the novel is something akin to the platonic sense of the soul before birth. The reminiscence of childhood becomes the anamnesis of that other world, the other life beyond the statues that Seferis' protagonists are vainly seeking in his Mythistorima. One of the most memorable passages in Aeolian Earth is set on a boat carrying the grandparents of the novelist's protagonist, Petros, away from their nat native land to a country they know nothing about. The grandmother is tired and goes to rest her head on her husband's chest, but she feels something like a marble under the old man's shirt. Ne Arga ta dactila tu yerota anigun to mandili, opu in a filagmeno to homa. Psachnun ke mesa, psachnun ke to dactila tis yayas, sana to haidevun. Tamakio tus da crismena, stekun e ki. Then ne tipota leo, ligo homa. Yi, ana aioli ki yi. Yi to topumas. What's here? What's this here, she asks, almost indifferently. The grandfather takes his hand, feels under his clothes, finds the small foreign body that rests on his chest, and hears the beating of his heart. What is it? It's nothing, says the grandfather, shamefacedly, like a child caught out doing something wrong. Just a little earth. Earth? Yes, a little earth from their earth, for them to plant some basil, she tells her, in the foreign land they're going to, to remember. Slowly, the old man's fingers open the handkerchief where he's kept the basil. He searches inside. The grandmother's fingers search too, as if to caress it. Their eyes, filled with tears, stay there. It's nothing, I say, a little earth. Earth, aeolian earth, earth from my place. The handful of aeolian earth is no ordinary metonym. This earth may represent the grandmother's, grandfather's farm and the land of Aeolia from which the Greeks are now expelled, but it is a place of the earth that has produced the beauty and bounty of the land that he has spent his life cultivating. His family will plant a basil bush in that earth in exile, and they will take something of the lost land with them. In contrast to Venezis's passionate evocation of the landscape of his grandfather's farm, Theotokas's Leonis is set in Constantinople, where the young protagonist develops from a child into an adolescent, playing with his Greek friends. In Taksim Park, dreaming of the Byzantine emperors with their long beards and splendid robes. Oliomos ixeran tupsnomus tupeknidiu apexo 
και ανα, ε, ανακατωτά χωρίς να τους έχουν διδακτεί ποτέ. Ήταν παραδομένοι από αμνημόβευτούς χρόνους μαζί με τους θρύλους του Βυζαντίου. Τους άρπαζε κανείς μέσα στον αέρα του κήπου τον ίδιο καιρό που μάθανε το αλφαβήτα. Everyone knew the rules of the game by heart and backwards without ever, ever having been taught. They were handed down from time immemorial together with the legends of Byzantium. One caught them in the air of the garden at the same time as one learned their ABC. Τον παλιό καιρό, συλλογιζότανε, σε αυτούς εδώ τους δρόμους περνούσαν οι δικοί μας αυτοκράτορες. Εκείνοι ήταν αυτοκράτορες άξιοι του ονόματος. Ο Βασίλειος, ο Βουλγαροκτόνος, ο Νικηφόρος Φωκάς, ο Ιωάννης Τσιμικής, ο Μανουήλ Κόμνινος, πανύψιλοι, ντυμένοι στο χρυσάφι σαν δεσποτάδες, με τις ωραίες ξαντές γενιάδες τους, με το σεβάσμο ύφος τους, που είχες όρεξη να τους φιλήσεις το χέρι. In the old days, in those streets, they thought our emperors passed by. They were emperors worthy of their names. Basil the Bulgar Slayer, Nikiforos Fokas, Ioannis Tsimiskis, Emmanuel Komninos, very tall, dressed in gold like bishops, with beautiful blonde beards, with their venerable expression that made you want to kiss their hands. The novel may be set in a city rather than in the countryside, but the children dream of a glorious past in the park that becomes another Garden of Eden. As the shadows of the First World War fall on Leonis, he accepted, accepts it philosophically, proud in many ways to feel he's part of history. He and his teenage Greek friends have absorbed a vision of Constantinople infused with the philosophy of the Megali there, the dream of Greece recapturing its Byzantine glory, an ambition that turned into a disaster, but which sustained the young Greeks not only through the war, but even through the Asia Minor campaign. History for the young Leonis was a force that swept over civilizations as it had done over Byzantium, passing over him in turn. It was only when he arrived in Athens that he realized that the dream that had thrilled him as he grew up in Constantinople with its mythical emperors in their fine robes had dissolved. Στο βάθο του ορίζοντα, μέσα στο θάμπο και την δροσιά του Αιγαίου, του φαινόταν πω έμελαν να προβάλλουν οι μεγάλοι ίσχυοι του Βυζαντίου. Έξαφνα του φαινόταν πω τίποτα δεν είχε μεσολαβήσει, πω όλα αυτά που του συνέβαιναν τώρα δεν ήταν παρά ένα όραμα, πω η αλήθεια ήταν εκεί, στον ορίζοντα μέσα στον πούσι της όμορφη, όμορφης θάλασσας. Μα το πούσι διαλυόταν και οι ίσκοι έσβησαν, έσβησαν μέσα στο γυαλιστερό γαλάζιο στοιχείο. Είχαν περάσει πια όλα αυτά. Είχαν τελειώσει, φαίνεται, για πάντα. On the depths of the horizon, in the dazzle and dampness of the Aegean, it seemed to him that the great shades of Byzantium were about to emerge. Suddenly, it seemed as if nothing had intervened, as if it all was happening to him now, and it was only a vision, and that the truth was there on the horizon, in the fog above the lovely sea. But the fog dissolved, and the shades had disappeared in the shining blue element. All that had passed, it seemed, forever. In Cosmas Politicis at Hatzifrancos, an extraordinary image from childhood, perhaps a true memory of the authors, perhaps an imaginary one, interrupts the scene of the destruction of the city. A child is playing with a hoop as the city burns. Did Politis, who was a child at the time, remember what he saw as he played in the street? Even when the old man, Yakumis, uh, recall, recounts the horror of the great fire that destroyed his city and his life. There is a dreamlike quality to his description of the amber flames and sp smoke that fill the air, a terrifying beauty in a scene of mayhem. Politis, who wrote his novel 30 years after the other two novelists published theirs, described his motivation in writing about his childhood years in the city, saying, 
I found myself in the grip of an intense nostalgia for the years of the First Great War, the armistice and the Allied campaign, a nostalgia for lost worlds and great historic moments imbued with the sweetness and bitterness of childhood and teenage memories. But without my being able to tell whether it was really a nostalgia for childhood or something like an old ailment which one day resurfaces under the influence of a change in atmos atmospheric conditions. Bitter yet sweet, nostalgia for a lost childhood is surely both. The longing for return is intensified by the impossibility of reclaiming the past or of reaching a particular topos. And yet, as Angela Kastrinaiki noted in her 2022 play, Six Blue Pencils for Smyrna, Lexicalasia, Molivia, Yadismirni, Politis, perhaps the most enigmatic and subtle of the writers of his generation, did in fact go back to Smyrna in 1924. Kastrinaiki tries to imagine the motivation for his return just two years after the horrific destruction of the city and imagines him retrieving some household possessions. Was it a piece of furniture that the fire passed over, a few household objects with sentimental value, or did he simply want to revisit the scene of a catastrophic uh, destruction? Whatever motivated the return, it would surely have only sharpened the pain of loss. Another writer who might have been included in this group is, uh, is Fotis Kondorlu. In his book, I Vali, My Homeland, Kondorlu expressed the loss of his home in biblical terms. I Vali is Kondorlu's Jerusalem, and he laments, laments its loss extravagantly, describing the city and its environs in precise detail, accompanied by his own drawings. The earth of that region, according to his account, was almost unnaturally fertile, its animals, trees, and plants abundant. The most affecting section of the book is a short piece entitled simply Miroloi, Lament. He describes weeping as he writes, San vaso metonu tis chrises meres puhathikane, pianate cardiamu, Itan oniro amathes, itan planema magikos. As I write down in my mind your golden days that were lost, my heart contracts. Was it a dream, do you think? Was it a magical delusion? Somehow, he tells his readers, he managed to live through the winter of exile in Greece in a state of numbness. But now that spring has returned, he sees in his mind the springtime landscape of his former home and a scalding wound in my heart torments me without mercy. I think about spring in my rocky mountain and my eyes stream. It is Kondoglu's lament that links the novels and poems of the 1930s generation to the Amanevas that so affected Kazantzakis. His nostalgia too is not without sweetness as he luxuriates in the memory of his landscape with its golden days in spring. By naming a section of his book simply Lament and referencing the biblical book of Lamentations, Kondoglu li links his pain to a larger volume of literature and to the widespread phenomenon of laments for lost cities that include not only Jerusalem, but Sumer and Ur, Troy, Carthage, Rome. In the later Greek tradition, the best known of these laments are for the loss of Constantinople. Like 1922, 1543 is a date engraved in the Greek memory, one that marks a complete rupture with a time and a place. Descriptions of the fall of Constantinople to the Turks by 15th and 16th century historians mention the sound of lamentation that accompanied it, and a rich vein of learned and folk literature grew out of the final assault on the city. The best known of these is probably the Anakalima, uh, it is Constantinopolis that begins with a reference to the sounds of grief heard in the dying city. Thrinos, klasmos, kiodirmos, kestenagmos, kilipi. Lamentation, weeping, wailing, and sighing, and grief. And it continues, they have lost their homes, their saintly city, their pride, their glory, and um, 
it's expressed in a wonderful language of myth and folk song-like imagery that includes a, 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 an amazing dialogue between two boats, one of which acts as a messenger. The heavily laden boat carries the weight of the bitter news, tapikra mandata, a message told first by the boat itself, then by the emperor. The tradition of laments for lost cities was a familiar model for the refugee writers from Smyrna and the cities of the Asia Minor coast. But there was a more than a parallel between the two traditions. The Megali there was a dream of recapturing the city of Constantinople and the lands surrounding it. And it was a strong motivation for the Greek invasion of the hinterland of Smyrna in 1922. Ostensibly a campaign to secure the countryside around the largely Greek city of Smyrna, the Greek invasion had wider ambitions of moving northwards towards Istanbul. The failure of the campaign uh, put an end to that dream and the irredentist ambition of the Greek state to recapture a great multi-ethnic city. It also ended the centuries-long presence of Greek culture in Asia Minor. No wonder the two traditions became conflated. Losing Smyrna meant the loss of what was expressed in the folk tradition as ours once more. As Michael Hertzfeld points out, Nikolaos Politis and other folklorists who supported the Mgali there had encouraged a version of the song in which ours is substituted for yours. Uh, the version most Greeks know today ends with the picture of the heroic emperor exhorting the virgin not to tremble and the icon not to weep because Pali metachronia kekerus, pali dikiamastane. Again, in the years and times to come, Constantinople will be ours once more. Laments for the lost city of Smyrna can be seen as a direct descendant of an older tradition, without the false hopes of recovering past glory. The Amanes that Kazantzakis recorded and recognized as a, as a profound lament was already a form popular before 1922. Angeliki Papazoglu, a refugee from Smyrna, spoke of how the Greeks used to listen to the minore, which is a type of amane. In Athens, she said people didn't ask for minores, whereas in Smyrna, they had been favorites of the Greek audience because, she said, we in Smyrna told our sorrows with them. Meto minore, tragoudousa meton ponomas, pumaste sklavomeni sti turkia, meto minore, then to ksak nusame, selame olo na to simomaste, na naume mesa maskandili, elpiza, zestasia. With the minores, we sang our pain as we are enslaved in Turkey. With the minore, we didn't forget it. We wanted always to remember, to light a candle inside us. Hope, warmth. And she goes on to quote the lyrics of some popular minores. Mono mi ora hero me otan glico harazi, po anapavate i cardia ke den anastenazi. Otan o korax lefkanthi ke i hion mavrisi, tote ki apotostithos mu, afti fotia the sfisi. Ke eno nusame o iti sklavia, tila di milusana ya ti sklavia. Only for an hour when I'm happy, when the sun sweetly rises and the heart takes a rest and stops sighing. When the crow turns white and the snow black, then this fire will be quelled in my breast. And we meant our slavery. The description of the pleasure the Smyrniot Greeks took in singing and listening to Amane, this reminds us of Cousin Zyke's description of listening to an Amane, despite the fact that it is a man that Cousin Zyke hears singing an Amane, he ascribes the oriental side of the modern Greek to the female inheritance, to the mysterious but profound side of the Greek character. An unexpected source of oriental nostalgia comes from Mikis Theodorakis. In his 70th year, the composer decided to pay tribute to the female and oriental side of his own inheritance, to his mother Aspasia Pulaiki, whose family were from Chesmenia Smyrna. On the liner notes for his album, Asiki Kopulaiki, Gallant Little Bird, a disc that added a surprising new element to his compositions, he describes meeting the musicians, uh, the composer and arranger, Yanis Pathas, and the musicians who had arranged his music for him as a surprise. I showed them the photographs of the Pulaiki's family, 
um, taken in Chesme a few years before the Asia Minor catastrophe, and I said, the record must be called Sikiko uh, Pulaiki, so as to show the roots of its inspiration. And he spelt Pulaiki with an eater on the end, um, which was a tribute to his maternal side. Um, it's true, it's very important to me because my other musical roots, whether Cretan or popular or European, dominate my music so as to do an injustice to the maternal side, which hopefully should be stronger. This music takes us straight to the shores of Asia Minor, where Greek culture once shone in sweet Ionia, my mother's roots. In his memoir, um, the Ways of the Archangel, Theodorakis talks about childhood visits to his mother's family who had fled the, to the island of Chios and of how they always talked about Chesme and the house and garden they claimed they could see far away across the strait. The, strait. the women of his maternal family would sit and open the trunk in which they kept the title to their former property on the mainland, after which they would all weep together and lament between their laments, they'd sing a hymn to the Virgin. Untypically, Theodorakis did not set the poetry he had discovered or written himself to music. Instead, he commissioned a poet whose work he admired to write new verses. The poet was Mikhailis Ganath, and in, he, he, um, is, it was sung by Vasilis Lekas, and in fact, Lekas and uh, Spathas went to Theodorakis with the musical arrangement they'd made, and Leka sang a song called Fire in Smyrni, which describes the fire. But there is um, a, a poem and a song on this surprising record that for me captures Theodorakis' grandmother and his sisters and their sense of loss. It's called San Orfanon, Takubian, Tafilthisenia, Tis Ventales. Ketaktenia, ston cesme tafisan olla, panos ti palia consola. Kena fangari o loido, se olitim soio, kena fangari o loyomo, sti smirni, ke sti pergamu, san orfano. Ti rodia ke tokaiki, ta desan condasso spiti, yana pari to fangari, yana tavgali sto plomari. The song's called Like an Orphan. The ivory buttons, the fans and combs, they left them all on the old dresser in Chesme. And a moon, just as it is in all the Mediterranean, and a full moon in Smyrna and Pergamon, like an orphan. The pomegranate and the fishing boat were tied near the house so the moon would take them, and they would come out at Plomari. The description of the small feminine objects left behind on a dresser the orphaned moon, the fishing boat, and pomegranate are the particulars which capture the bittersweet nostalgia Greeks feel for the lost world of Asia Minor, a world so close to Greece and yet unrecoverable, unvisitable. Proximity adds a more painful dimension to the nostalgia of Theodorakis' grandmother and her unmarried sisters. There, just across the water, and yet as unreachable as Shangri-La, lies a city that would once homeland to hundreds of thousands of Greeks. And even if it could be visited, as Cosmas Politis did, nothing would be left of the society that once filled its streets, its countryside, its villages. All that can be done is to remember. And there is pleasure in the remembering, that bitter sweetness of nostalgia, especially if it is shared. Nostalgia may be a Greek word, but of course the pain of exile is not an exclusively Greek phenomenon. We live in an age of massive and dangerous border crossings, of walls designed to keep people in or out, of internal and external exile. I don't wish to end this talk with a suggestion that there is inevitable sweetness mixed with the condition of exile. For those who spend their lives hungry or in the gray half-life of a refugee camp, for those who are tortured, humiliated, driven to suicide, there is no bittersweet remembrance of things past. There is only the misery of now. For the Asia Minor Greek refugees, there was hardship, rejection, and loss. But there was also a possibility of life in a place where they had much in common with the local inhabitants. 
Theirs was a large community, and some had the means to express their sense of loss in literature and music on behalf of that community. They were listened to and read because they produced works of nostalgia that were also works of art. There is in the Greek folk tradition a sense of the value of pain and the refusal of comfort. I suggest that this tradition informs the literature of exile, not lightening the pain of displacement, but insisting on the memory of what has been lost. Thank you. I don't know, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, Gail, thank you very much uh, for uh, this uh, tour de force where we, we, uh, you took us from Byzantium, and as a Byzantinist, I'm, I'm very thankful for that, uh, from mm -hmm. Byzantium, Constantinople, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the emperors uh, through 1453 to 1922 and, and to today. Um, there, there are uh, many wonderful thoughts uh, that uh, were woven uh, through what you said, uh, ideas of uh, uh, sort of Jerusalem, even Shangri-La, mm -hmm. and uh, then, and, and of course, we are uh, sort of really situated in the Aegean uh, and uh, the Amanes. Um, so, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, also, w this is a hybrid lecture, so I, I don't see any open questions uh, from afar, uh, but uh, are there any questions? I must have said everything. Oh, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really amazing. Um, I was reminded so much of, you know, hearing stories in my own family's past about leaving um, Eastern Europe during the pogroms and during the Holocaust, and it's just so effective to hear all of these shared experiences. And I'm wondering if there's any value that you see in discussing these um, in terms of frameworks of trauma responses. These any, in any, I, I didn't hear the Sorry. Any, if, um, if, if you see any value or what, if we can gain anything new from looking at these artistic expressions of loss and these crises through the frameworks of trauma responses and more modern sort of um, understandings of how human beings relate to these, these types of experiences and losses and grief and things like that, or if maybe it's redundant at this point, but. I don't think so. I, think it, I do think it's valuable to know that, um, that, that the condition of exile and of being deprived of one's land, of one's home and so on, is a well nigh universal condition um, and I think it is probably helpful for people to know that, to realize when they're suffering that this is something that other people have been through. Um, I know that for me reading, reading literature that uh, seems to mimic my mood, whatever it is, you know, a mood of nostalgia or something, it, it's helpful to me. I'm a big reader so I read a lot of it but I also listen to a lot of music so I think anything that evokes the emotion that you're feeling at, at the time, if you're feeling nostalgic or so, um, it reminds you that you're not alone and that many other people have been through this, for one thing. And also, um, I, th I think people react to... One of the things that I think is so fortunate for pe people who have a voice, a literary voice or a musical voice, is that on behalf of other people, um, they can express something so uh, powerfully and so wonderfully that I think it helps a lot. I'm, I'm sure it did. You know, I, I, I've lived in Greece during difficult times, including the beginning of the dictatorship, and, and uh, I think people, I know that people, you know, read a lot of poetry, listened in secret to, to music they weren't supposed to listen to and so on, and I think it was an, a great help to them to feel that other people had been through these things before them. Anybody else got a question? Yes. Thank you for uh, all this uh, travel into you know, history and uh, 
literature and all this um, through your talk. But I would, I would like to um, uh, observe, mm -hmm. however, uh, on, on top of everything that you said. It's more like an observation, like a, yes. more than a question, which is that uh, we can all feel that the second generation mm -hmm. of uh, people from Asia Minor mm -hmm. uh, who were not born in Asia Minor, in Smyrna or whatever, they were in Athens, they, they were born in Greece, suffered uh, what the immigrants uh, suffered, and they heard all these stories, not from um, you know, novelists or uh, mm -hmm. writers, but from their own yes, uh, the family grand, members. Yes. And it's amazing how they, the younger generation brought again all this suffering and nostalgia mm -hmm. back. And you, you can see it like from works like uh, from Didoso Tiriu, even from people who, uh, who uh, dealt with music, like uh, um, uh, Domna Samiu, who yeah. brought all this music mm -hmm. back in. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's amazing how these strong feelings uh, came through a second generation. And yes. this is really amazing, because like you said with Fedorakis also, who you know, uh, had uh, a poet write music mm -hmm. uh, just, in, just for, for his case, yes. to show what his family yes. uh, had suffered and brought to Greece. So uh, it is a very, very strong experience for the, the, the Hellenes, from the Ionians, the Greeks, that really uh, moves mm -hmm. on and on. Thanks. I agree. I agree. It's, it, and it's very interesting what you say about the next generation, people who didn't go through it themselves but heard from their grandparents and great-grandparents. Um, and uh, it did, this society did give them some room to do that. Whereas, um, you know, I know many Jewish refugees who went to America or, or to uh, uh, Australia um, were discouraged their children from hearing about or talking about uh, the pogroms, for example, let, let alone the Holocaust. There was, a, there was this, a desire to forget rather than to remember. And um, it's hard to know what one could say if one was a survivor of Auschwitz, how, how one could say anything um, that had any, any sweetness in it. It was so appalling. But, but I think that there was room in Greek society then because of the sheer numbers of refugees. I mean, it, it was a quarter of the, popu the population rose by one quarter, a huge influx of refugees, and they did have each other. Uh, and they had some, even though they encountered some prejudice, they, they were on the whole able to overcome that and, and pass memories on to the next generation, I think. Yes. Um, thank you. That was <clears throat> very moving. My question, I think, is did this sense of nostalgia work <clears throat> as a bridge between human beings, between refugees and old Greece, or did it serve as a barrier and a distinction between the refugees and, and the old country? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. What, what what well, did you say was a barrier, might be a barrier? The, um, the sense of nostalgia, this very yes. vivid, very um, beautifully crafted mm -hmm. sense of otherness, did this create in the minds of the refugees a distinction between themselves and the villagers of, you know, mm -hmm. of, of old Greece? Did, they, did this make them feel different? Did they, this help? strengthen differences, or was there a bridge built between the two populations through shared emotion? That's a big subject, and I've, I've written on it in other places, but there was a prejudice against the, the oriental type of singing, especially Amanevas. They were looked down on by a lot of Greeks, often Greeks on the left, uh, who thought they were, not, they were very negative, and um, you know, a poet like Palamas you know, writes, um, very negatively about Amanevas and so on. There was a feeling that it wasn't Greek enough. And um, when Kamal Ataturk banned Amanevas in Turkey for not being Western enough, then the Greeks decided, well, we're more Western than the Turks. We should be banning Amanevas as well. 
And there's a big history of, uh, a big um, controversy in history and literature about the prejudice against that oriental side of Greek. Um, and um, I think it's completely past now that sort of uh, dichotomy, but in, in those days, you know, I'm talking about 1930s, for example, um, there was prejudice against it. You're right, I don't think it was always a bridge. What was a bridge was musicianship. Greek musicians understood that these people who came from Izmir and uh, uh, Constantinople, they were good musicians and they knew things about the type of music that they were playing that the Greeks didn't know. They had, some of them read uh, scores and could read music. And so there was a, I think there was a, uh, a feeling among the musical community particularly, and, and maybe on the literary side as well, that there was something of value to be had in this music. And um, they incorporated a lot of it into their own music. The whole ph phenomenon of the Rebetica is some, a wonderful amalgam, I think, of Eastern and Western influences. But it's a good question, because I think there were barriers you know, I didn't, don't think the Greeks wanted to see themselves as Oriental in some way. On the other hand, they loved the Oriental side of themselves. You know, there was something they enjoyed about that side of themselves. So there was a dichotomy in their own reaction, I think. Um, I'll try to combine three questions. Uh, the comments that we get uh, on uh, uh, Zoom are very complimentary of your talk. Uh, I will start uh, with uh, a, a more academic uh, sort of request uh, by Anastasia Zita. Would it be possible to post a reading and listening list of Amanes so that we, we too may become acquainted with this incredible body of work? I don't know who would be able and, and is the expert to do this, but... Uh, if, you go on to the, if you go on to YouTube or anywhere and you look up Amanes, you will find a lot. If you look at, if you do it in Greek, if you do it in English, it's much harder, but if you do it in Greek, you'll find quite a lot of literature, and there are now so many fine remasterings of old recordings that weren't available. You know, when I started working on Rebetica, you couldn't find any uh, of the Asia Minor music on disc unless you were a collector. It just wasn't there, and um, since this sort of rash of you know, thousands of remasterings that took place in the 70s and 80s. Um, there's a rich uh, volume of these Amanezes. I adore them because what I think is not well understood even by Greeks who like this sort of music <coughs> is that, yes, it was a lament for an emotional thing, but it was where a singer showed off her chops, you know. If she was good, she could move from one uh, Romos from one mode into another and back again. And uh, what I love to hear, and you could hear it on that recording, that's why I chose that and I forgot to mention it, is that she's talking to the uh, Santuri player and she's greeting him as an equal, if not a superior. She's saying, good on you, you're playing well, like a jazz player, a jazz singer would. You know, it was like Bessie Smith would say to one of her, her the drummer or something. Uh, it's um, a wonderful uh, illustration to me of that was a world where women were not uh, taken lightly. They were taken seriously. There's no substitute, after all, for the female voice. You, unless you want a castrato to sing something, you've got to have a female voice. So the exception to the sort of quietening of female voices was in singing, and women musicians were not only on an equal with men, but they were the stars. Marika Papagika, who came from the island of Kos, went to New York, cut 250 sides in, in a year. She was the most popular singer in New York, and she sang a lot of Amanezes, amongst other things. And um, uh, her, she opened a club on 8th Avenue, and it was called Marika's Place. It wasn't named anything else, it was her place, and it was extraordinarily popular. So. I think about um, the Amanevas as being, in some way, uh, one of the few places where women could really shine and do their, do their musical work uh, and be really respected for it. 
So the, the, the other two questions that I will try, I mean, I will Sorry, I'm read both of them. No, no, please. <laughs> uh, so Stavros Karajan is complimenting you on your talk and he says, uh, could it be possible to ever read my, in expressions of nostalgia some hope in the future? Theodor Eikos did it, Hachit Eikos did it, and it went on with the generation of Sobopolis and, and uh, uh, Papazak, all of these people in Thessaloniki. Uh, there, there are lots of people, I think, now, young people, who are doing, encouraging the creative things with this material, which is endless. I mean, Greece is so rich in musical material, I don't know anywhere else like it. So, if, you know, if you don't like one part of Greek music, you can choose another, but... Um, hopefully to do something that's not simply nostalgia, that is nostalgia combined with, with some sort of creative juice that makes it something new. I don't know where I've got, I've got to be lost in that question. <laughs> Maybe could we hear the song uh, ah, that you were talking yes. about? <laughs> I wanted to put on a little bit of the Asiki Kopulaki um, during the talk, but um, we were a bit short of time, and now um, we could at least listen to it, and uh, you could hear some of what Theodorakis uh, invented a rhythm that he called a psychico. It has nothing to do with any, this is one of the things I like about him, is that he was always inventing new things, and he, he made a rhythm up, I mean, it a non-existent rhythm. It sounds like something Asia Minor, but you listen to it again, you think, what? Where's that beat coming from? And so he said, I thought I'd have a, a beat, a, a rhythm that sounded to me like something asikiko. So he invents this rhythm and writes a whole lot of music uh, calling it asikiko pulanki. And it's, um, what can you say about this? It's a real sort of uh, amalgam of influences and the, and you'll hear, as you listen to it, the amalgam of influences in the arrangement. But uh, I think that these young musicians, Spathis, who's a won wonderful musician, I think, did a fantastic job with, with translating it into something modern. So I'll leave you with the music, I think. <laughs> and we'll talk informally. Στα μάτια μου καπονός Κι ώσπου να ρίξει μια βροχή ο ουρανός Ένα κορίτσι σε παλιά φωτογραφία Τα κλαίει χρόνια τους νεκρούς του καθενός Δεμένη δρόμη και η θάλασσα θεία Ας ήταν κάποτε ανάσα κι αγκαλιά Γεμάτη τώρα από φράγκικα καραδιά Και ξένους ναύτες που φυλάνε τα σκαλιά Ασυχή κοπουλάκι με μια φτερούγα Που βρήκες φέντρο να κρύφτεις Τόπο να σταθείς Ασίκη κοτραγούδι Γαρύφαλο πληγή Ένας λιγμός Εγέννησε Και έγινε σκραυγή Σαν το ψάρι στη Σεριά Ποιος θα μαζέψει από τους δρόμους τα παιδιά Λίστες τα αρπάζουν και πιλάτι τα δικάζουν Και τρομαγμένα τα πουλάν στην αγορά Τα μένα σπίτια και μια σπίθα στην καρδιά Μα η Ελλάδα όπω 
πάντα μακριά Όποιος γλιτώσει τη φωτιά και το μαχαίρι Θα βρει μια μάνα που θυμίζει η μητριά Σε δέντρο να κρύφτεις το όπο να σταθείς Ασίκη πατραγούδι γρήφαδο πληγή Ένας λιγμός εγέννησε και έγινε σκραδιγή for this beautiful presentation. And for those of you who are here, we can join us uh, downstairs for a glass of wine. Thank you, Gail, thank you.